Hello and bonjour. My name is KJ and I am the lead pastor at EIC Turn. And as a church, we are continuing our series entitled Second Timothy, A Call to Persevere. So if you have a Bible handy nearby, please open it and find the book of Second Timothy. And we're looking at chapter two today, verses 20 through 22. Let me read those verses for us and then pray as we begin. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. This is the word of the Lord. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from useful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. Let's pray together. Lord, as we look now at your word, I pray that you would open our eyes to see our task that's set before us and how we are to prepare for this task. Uh, Lord, may we may you show us what we are to pursue in life, and may you show us why it is such good news that you set us upon this course. Lord, do this in us for Christ's glory, we ask it. Amen. Perseverance takes preparation. If you want to persevere, you've got to prepare. Just ask any runner, ask any cross-country runner, well, you could ask me. Once upon a time, I was a cross-country runner, believe it or not. I remember my first year on the team, and our team captain came to me after school one day and said, the two of us are going to go out and do a bit of training together. And I said, okay, where are we going? He said, you'll see. Uh, he then drove me to the city limits and said, we are going to run from our city to the next city, from Sylacauga to Childersburg, which it was the next city over. It was a long way away. Uh, when I asked him why we were running so far, he said, because Childersburg has a Taco Bell. Taco Bell. If you didn't know, Taco Bell is to tacos what McDonald's is to hamburgers. And at that time, Taco Bell had a slogan that was, run for the border. That was, that was the slogan, run for the border. And I don't know if that slogan inspired much taco eating in the 1990s, but it did inspire my cross-country team captain to push the boundaries of how far we could run by running from our city to the next to go to Taco Bell. I, I remember running most of that afternoon and for a large portion of it, running down the median of a busy highway. When we finally arrived at Taco Bell, the cashier said, y'all ran here from where now? Wow, tell me what I can get you boys. And I said, just the phone, please. <laughs> I need to call my parents to come pick me up. <laughs> While my body had somewhat prepared for the run, my stomach was certainly not prepared to enjoy any tacos at the finish. Real perseverance takes preparation. On a much more serious note than my short career as a cross-country runner is the experience of Richard Wormbrand. Wormbrand was a Romanian pastor who was taken by the communist secret police and imprisoned for more than a decade. In his book, Tortured for Christ, Wormbrand remarks again and again that if we want to persevere through hardships, it will take preperation. No one perseveres for long, he saw, who hasn't prepared themselves for it in advance. He said that in prison, nobody resists who has not renounced the pleasures of life beforehand. If we are to persevere, it will take preparation. This was true for the Apostle Paul. After his Damascus Road experience meeting Jesus, he didn't just jump straight into the trials and tribulations of ministry. He first took three years of preparation away in Arabia. 
In this way, Paul's life actually mirrored the preparation time that the rest of the apostles had. Remember that before being sent out on this world-changing mission, the disciples had three years of every day on-the-job training with Jesus. Even Jesus modeled for us the importance of preparation. Through the years of obscurity that we don't know anything about, through the temptations in the wilderness that we do know something about, the lives of Jesus, of Paul, of the rest of the apostles, all harmonize with what our experience tells us is true. That perseverance tomorrow will take preparation today. But if that's the case, then what kind of preparation do we need to do? Runners need to run in order to prepare. What kind of preparation do we as Christians need? Runners know what their preparation is for, pursuing the goal of winning the race. But as Christians, what are we preparing to pursue? What is our pursuit that all this preparation helps us with? I think it's these kinds of questions that the Apostle Paul answers for us in verses 20 through 22. And he begins his answer of these questions with an illustration. Look at verse 20. It says, Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, here's an illustration that works well. Even 20, 20, two, let's try two, 2,000 years. 2,000 years later, this is an illustration that still works well. If someone were to challenge you to come up with an illustration that would still work two millennia from now, could you do it? Paul did it. You would be wise to follow Paul here in making that illustration one of domestic life. Domestic life in this illustration is still very recognizable. It hasn't really changed. Domestic scenes today, just like 2,000 years ago, are filled with vessels and utensils, with cups, with bowls, with plates, with spoons, with tools of various designs and uses. Some of these we use to celebrate special occasions, to honor special guests. Like when we get out the Christmas plates at Christmas, when we get out the fine china for guests, when the, that fancy serving plate comes out that you only see the Thanksgiving turkey on. These things are, are meant to honor those who, who enjoy them. Some vessels are reserved for honor, but others we keep under the sink, don't we? We use them to clean out the drains or the gutters or the toilet. In Paul's day, some vessels would be used as the toilet. This is just the way it is. It's the way it has to be. It's the way it must be. This is the way we would expect things to be in a fallen, mixed bag world that we live in. A world full of death and decay and dirty laundry. <laughs> a world where mildew grows in the shower. A world that is full of some yucky realities. But the marring of this world has not completely obscured the good in it. There are still moments of domestic bliss, of honored guests joyfully welcomed into the home, of household vessels used to show love and serve one another. My birthday gift this year from Lynn was a tin of Angelina's hot chocolate. And the other night she made me a cup, she measured it out, she heated up the milk in a pan and gave it to me in a special cup. And as I drank it in front of our electronic fire, <laughs> it felt like all was right in the world. Vessels can be used to convey love and honor, especially when they're filled with hot chocolate and especially when the words His Lordship were written on my, my mug. <laughs> uh, that, that's the way I felt. I felt honored. I, 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 my heart rejoiced in it. Many times, however... In, in a crazy world like ours, we find that also this fact to be true, that one man's trash is another man's treasure. I was thinking about this as I was contemplating this verse, that every single plate displayed with honor on the wall in our house, 
uh, which we only use on special occasions when we have special guests. Every single one was found at a charity shop, a thrift store, which means that someone else had to discard it along the way. What we treasure for someone else before us, it wasn't even worth keeping at all. Here is something important to see. Vessels can be upgraded from disuse and dishonor to special use and particular honor. I think Lynn was actually doing something very much like God when she went into those charity shops and redeemed the unwanted dishes out of it. Lynn, Lynn would rejoice to hear me say that. <laughs> Likewise, household vessels, they can be upgraded, but they can also be downgraded. Who hasn't seen a favorite toothbrush be downgraded to scrubbing mold in the bathroom at some point? We have a Tupperware bowl that once held the most delicious leftovers in the world, but it has now been downgraded. Downgraded to catching the drips, the dripping water behind the upstairs toilet. That's, that's what it's doing at the moment. But one day, perhaps, one day, perhaps, We'll fix the toilet upstairs, and the Tupperware bowl will return to a more honorable use. But before that can occur, something first must happen. The toilet must be fixed. But beside that, what else must happen? That Tupperware bowl must be cleaned, right? It must be cleansed. Dishonorable vessels can be upgraded with the proper treatment with the proper cleaning. And that's exactly what Paul says in verse 21. He says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Can you see your place now in this illustration that Paul is laying out? You are a vessel. You are a vessel, a vessel who has a maker and a master. But what, what is our master like? Our master is higher than all, but he also condescends down to the lowest of all. Vessels that others would reject as useless, he delights to make them useful once more and endows them with special honor. We are like that old piece of furniture left on the roadside. You know, your street has that one day a month, right? When you can put out big things and they come and collect it. And there's things out there always that no one wants. But God is like the master craftsman who sees his heart goes out and he restores that broken set aside bit of furniture better than it ever was. In the master's hands, it is repurposed and actually made more complete than it ever was. How does this transformation from useless to useful happen? Look at verse 21. It's by cleansing, by washing, by stripping away the old dirt and muck and paint. What is it that we need to be cleansed from, you may ask? Paul actually doesn't tell us here specifically in this verse. He literally says, if anyone cleanses himself from these and stops right there. Some translators will supply a word like these things. Some will go even farther and say these dishonorable things. But perhaps Paul doesn't need to get specific because we don't really need him to. We know where we need cleansing, right? We know most often what's holding us back. And those things could be very different for different people. For some, it's what they've done to others. For others, it's overcoming what some have done to them. Paul doesn't have to say it because those who come to Christ know it. We know it already. Part of coming to Jesus is having our eyes open to our need, to our need for cleansing. We come to Jesus recognizing that we've got it wrong and we need him to make it right. What kind of cleansing is this then? 
look at verse 21. What kind of cleansing is this in verse 21? I think the cleansing in verse 21 presupposes another kind of cleansing, the kind that comes with justification. You know what I'm talking about, right? In the moment of justification, in the moment we first believe and are saved, Jesus applies his cleansing blood over our lives, washing us, the scripture says, white as snow. Though your sin be like scarlet, I will wash it white as snow. In God's eyes now, we are perfectly clean because he sees us positionally in Christ. We are in his son. This kind of cleansing then is something entirely done by Jesus, right? I think Paul presupposes this kind of cleansing has happened and is speaking now about another kind, a kind of cleansing that is ongoing. The way he says it should clue us in. Look at what he says. Paul says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, cleanses himself. In justification, it's Jesus cleansing us. He is always the active party in that exchange. But here is a cleansing in which we have a very active role to play. In order to get at what this is, we need to see first what type of cleansing of cleans- what, what types of things this cleansing produces in us. Look at verse, the rest of verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. What is the goal of this kind of cleansing? Here it is in verse 21. Here's verse 21's answer. That you might be sanctified. That's what this cleansing's for. That you might be sanctified. That you might be useful. That you might be prepared for every good work. In other words, that you might be fruitful. That you might bear fruit to the glory of God. Now, where else have we heard these things come together before? Who else connects cleansing with bearing fruit? Answer? Jesus, right? Jesus. Jesus connects all these dots for us in his famous, I am the vine, you are the branches passage. Remember this, John 15? Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Literally, he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Okay, you tracking? So far, you may only see the fruit connection. We are to bear fruit useful to the vine dresser. But the connection to cleansing is also here in these verses. The word for prune, to prune, is literally to cleanse, to make clean in John 15, verse 2. That's why Jesus says in the next verse, verse 3, you are already clean. Do you see the connection? Verse 2, every branch that bears fruit, God prunes, he cleanses so that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3, you are already clean. You are already pruned. If you want to be fruitful and useful disciples, then you need cleansing, Jesus says. And, And if you are useful and fruitful, you need more cleansing to be more fruitful. Where does this kind of cleansing come from? Look at the rest of verse 3 in John 15. Jesus says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. You're clean because of the word. The cleansing Christ promises comes through his word. Why is that? Because being conformed to the word is the only real alternative we have to being conformed to the world. Picture it like this. Picture the cleansing that we need is like a renovation project, renovating a house. Nature has really taken its toll upon this house. There's a lot wrong with it. The foundations are unsound. The walls are breaking. Other walls need to be broken down. The wiring all needs to be reworked. Anyone who has done a home renovation knows 
that it takes a lot of perseverance. It's a long-term project, not an over the night, get it done type of thing. Change, you can only change one thing at a time, little by little. In this image, Christ's word is the approved plans for that renovation. Here's what, the, here's what it should look like. The approved plan gets the house back in working order, gets it back livable again. Jesus gets us back living as we were meant to live. He is repairing what sin has broken. But if we ignore his word, if we cast aside the plan, then all we're left with is doing what is right in our own eyes, in our own culture's eyes. And that is a patchwork mess, even at the best of times, isn't it? We won't be set apart. We won't be ready to do every good work in the world if we look identical to the world and to the culture around us. It's the word of Christ that cleanses us and sets us apart from the world. It sets us apart from the world for the world, for the good of the world. If we abandon the blueprint of God's word, we're only left doing whatever everyone else is doing, making a mess in our own way. But if we want to be useful instruments in the Redeemer's hands, then we need to have Christ's word continually renovating our hearts. Now, of course, it's good to go to Jesus and make those connections that the cleansing we need in order to be prepared for every good work comes through the word. Jesus just gave that to us in John 15. But if we were to read just a little bit farther in 2 Timothy, Paul would make the same connection to us just as clearly. Look down a little bit in chapter 3. Look at verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, where have we just heard that very same thing in the previous chapter? Verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself of these things, he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. You see two almost identical phrases, prepared for every good work, verse 21, equipped for every good work, verse 17 of chapter 3. Paul isn't giving us two different paths to arrive at very good work, every good work. You either get to arrive there through cleansing in chapter 2, or you get to go there through the scripture in chapter 3. I mean, you can see it, right? These aren't two paths. They are one together. The way we are cleansed and equipped for every good work is through the scripture. We are cleansed by having our minds renovated and renewed by God's word, replacing how we see the world naturally with how God sees the world. Christian, do you want to be a vessel for honor, upgraded from collecting wastewater behind a toilet somewhere to be set apart and useful to the master? Then you need to regularly cleanse and prepare your heart for every good work. And that only comes through God's word. God is well pleased to take the world's castoffs, but he only has one way of renovating and polishing them up, and it's through his word, through the gospel word. Every time you pick up the Bible, it's an opportunity to see that happen. This time, right now, as you're listening to God's word, it's a moment where God is often well pleased to do this cleansing work in our hearts and lives. As we gather together on Sunday afternoon to apply God's word and speak it to one another, it can easily be just one more step, another step forward in God's renovation project that is your life. The preparation that a cross-country runner needs is running. The preparation Christians need is the word. We need the Word's cleansing power to renew our minds and our hearts 
daily, moment by moment. But what do we need that preparation for? What are we being prepared to pursue? Verse 22 tells us what that is, answers that question for us. Look at verse 22. Paul says, now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. The word prepares us to pursue some things while also preparing us to flee from others. Verse 22, now flee from youthful lusts. Youthful lust is a very natural part of the old building, of the old self, of our old lives, of the building that desperately needs renovating. Sexual desire is one of the load-bearing columns that has gotten warped when our parents were cast out of the house, out of Eden. The load-bearing column of romantic love was damaged in, by the fall and needs to be put back in its proper place in order for it to be like God intended in the garden. What does correcting this problem often look like right now? It can look like a lot of running away. It can look like fleeing the occasions of sin. Like Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife, we flee from those situations that wrongfully bend and inflame our desires. So we don't mindlessly surf the web or TikTok if we know it will occasion sinful lust or envious desires in us. The English Puritans rightly said that it is a just and righteous thing with God that the man who would venture to dance upon the edge of the pit, that he should fall into it. It's just. If we see how close we can get to the edge of sin, instead of fleeing from it, it's a just thing that God allows us to fall into it every single time. But God isn't just calling us to flee from the bent and broken parts of our lives. He is calling us to pursue the good. Look again at verse 22. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue, run away from something, but run towards something. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. God is calling us to pursue righteousness. That is right action. He's calling us to pursue faith. That is right belief. He's calling us to pursue love, right motivation. He's calling us to pursue peace, right circumstances. Biblical peace is everything arranged as it should be. God is calling us to a life that is the total package here, to pursue all the things that make life as good as it is meant to be. This journey is too good to go it alone. I hope you see that. It's too good to go it alone. We are meant by God's design to make this journey with others. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. If Christian perseverance requires preparation, then Christian preparation requires two things that are outside of ourselves. We've already seen it. It requires the word, the gospel word. We saw that in verse 20 and 21. And according to verse 22, it also requires the gospel community, word and community. We run the race pursuing these things with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. So I think the application for us here is pretty clear. If you want to be a useful instrument in the Redeemer's hands, then you need to give yourself to the truth of God's word and give yourself to the family life of God's children. Perseverance takes preparation. And here is where we'll find it. Saturating our lives with God's word as we run the race alongside God's people. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that we would do just that. 
May we be a people increasingly committed to your word and cleansed by it. Lord, wash, (laughs) wash and renew our minds that we might see the world as you do, that our desires might reflect your desires, our heart, your heart. Lord, there is no way we could come to these things except that you speak them and reveal them to us. So may we see your heart and mind in the scripture and have our hearts and minds changed into your likeness. And Lord, I pray that we would do this together. We, we could not do this by ourselves. We need one another speaking truth and love so that we might grow up. Lord, do this in us for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's continue to process and apply this word as we gather together this afternoon at 3.30. Until then, au revoir and in Christ, bon courage.